me start to push towards a more organic profile for the entire university. When we won Best, Best Grass in Texas in 2012, we did it in all, all organically. So all of our amendments and anything that we used, techniques or weed control or anything like that was 100% entirely organic and that allowed us to be able to project into the rest of the campus. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so this is a projection of our, our history. So on the left side is what we won Best Grass in Texas for. This is technically called the entrance to the university. This is four small turf areas, and this was Palisades Zoiza. Um, and in 2012, we decided we wanted to go ahead and try and, and really project the university into the next century. And so with this, we used all organic amendments and we use a company, company called MicroLife. Um, and so we um, fertilized several times a year, four times a year, watered profusely. It was turf. Um, and as everyone knows, we spend more money on turf in this country than we spend on vegetable production. So we may have very well spent a little additional on this, but uh, what that did was in 2012 when we won Best Grass in Texas, that allowed us to project to the South Mall, which is the middle picture. And so in the middle picture, that grass that you see there is the six pack, which is right in front of the tower. And every year they would spend thirty to fifty thousand dollars replacing that grass. They would just completely tear it up, completely renovate it, and then lay down brand new grass so that every year during grand graduation we would have a fresh lawn for everyone to walk all over. Um, so after we won Best Grass in Texas on the left, we, I asked them, I said, just give me one year. One year, and if we can make this grass sustainable, great. If we can't, then you can go ahead and rip it up and spend the enormous amount of money to replace it anyways. Well, now we're on year eight. Um, we didn't have graduation this year, obviously, but um, if that has allowed us for a little bit extra time of rejuvenation of the grass and the soil. Um, but basically over that eight years that had allowed us to be able to educate the university that we could do things in a more sustainable manner and not spend so much money on turf and grass and rejuvenation. And so on the far right picture, that's the Blanton Art Museum, which is pointing towards the Capitol. Um, and that was another area that we rejuvenated. And so basically after we showed them that we could save so much money on the main mall, that we moved to the uh, Littlefield Pond, to various other uh, areas on campus that were highly traversed and considered um, high profile areas. And so once we converted those to organic, at this point now we are literally 97% organic on campus. There are certain things we can't do organically when you're talking about um, bed bugs and you know various bugs and diseases that might progress into the dormitories or buildings or things like that. Sometimes we have to take dramatic steps, um, but for the most part we have, we are pre-emergent free. We are as entirely pesticide and herbicide free as we can be. Um, with our in, in, integrated pest management system, we really do try every single method we possibly can before moving to something chemical um, for everyone's health and for, you know, the, for the health of the soil and the plants in the system. Uh, next slide. Um, so this was us paving the way. Um, basically, this was in 2008 when we started the project. And so we used um, aeration. We used humates. Um, humates is a mined source of potassium and carbon um, and by using humates it's basically like a compressed version of compost. You're using everything that would go dormant in the soil and adding it to a soil that generally in the past has been treated with chemicals and most chemicals will destroy the um, the biology that lives in the soil, making it a little bit harder each time that you add those chemical fertilizers or pre-emergence or pesticides or herbicides to rejuvenate your grass or plant material, whatever it might be, um, to its current state. And so by doing this organically, we started to show people that you could do things a different way and build up your soil rather than continuously having to feed it. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is a kind of up close of South Mall. If you can see on the top left hand picture, that's what it looked like every year before they would lay out entirely new grass and new seed and relay everything to where literally 30 to $50,000 job every year. And so the bottom left hand picture was the first year that we did it. And on the top right hand picture is a more recent picture. Uh, I think that was about two years ago, right before our last graduation ceremony that we had. And so you can see that we have managed to keep up the um, turf uh, by just continuing to do things in a more sustainable fashion. Um, things like clo closing off the area, not allowing, not allowing heavy equipment, um, really trying to reduce the compaction and by using only or organic amendments, by using compost and things like that. And so um, that really allowed us to project our organic vision throughout the university. And so now just being able to do things more organically allows us to save water, to save the amount of fertilizer we put out, the amount of maintenance that we have to do in certain areas and things like that. And so that projected me to be able to carry on into the medical district. Um, and so next slide, please. So uh, in 2016, I was recruited as a crew leader to be able to start taking care of the Dell Medical District. And that was mainly because I had been able to pilot a lot of the organic programs on campus. And so the Dell Seton Medical Center at University of, of Austin was a, a combination of the Wildflower Center, of the Boston Botanical Gardens, um, the New York Botanical Gardens, the Siglo Group, um, which is a ecologist group that we continue to use, uh, and a couple other groups that basically everyone got together and decided that we haven't had a conglomerate medical district built inside of the United States for several decades. And so this was a combination of various different entities to try and create a area and a district that was built differently that could hopefully help people medically and mentally um, and physically to recover faster and to be able to experience a different type of landscape and lifestyle around them while they were recovering. Um, so this is a very nice scene of right in front of when the medical center was built. This was literally right after it was built and we had seated. Um, and we'll carry on. Next slide. So some of our stats is we are a 16.2 acre site and it's around eight to nine acres of landscaping itself. The landscape cost was a little under 16 million, around $15.6 million. Um, and this was all from the various type of equipment we used, um, from resourced plant material, from we had engineered soils brought in, we had soil materials brought out um, and plant material grown within a certain distance. Part of our site's requirement was that we had to be able to retain 80% of our rainfall up to a, on the site up to two inches. We actually retain 85% of our rainfall up to a three inch event on our site. And this is important when you're talking about flood mitigation. So the University of Texas owns a little under 19% of Waller Creek. The rest of it is privately owned. So when you buy a house or you buy a business or whatever and Waller Creek is backed up behind it, that is considered to be part of your property. And generally people don't necessarily take a lot of care when it comes to creek care or riparian restoration. So what we've done inside of our district and owning as much as we do is that we've done a lot of restoration work. We remove a lot of invasives. We try and keep our area up as much as we possibly can. So as a uh, a um, description that we last year removed 121 50 gallon trash bags of trash from the creek after major rainfall events um, or after tailgates or anything that might have contributed an additional amount of trash. My team goes down into the creek and we remove as much invasive, invasive material considering trash um, or sleeping bags or um, you know, blankets, clothing. Um, sometimes we have competition. Uh, how many pairs of poopy pants did you find inside of your creek today? Um, so we remove a large amount of material from the creek to try and make it that much cleaner for everyone who's going into Lady Bird, Lady Bird Lake or further down the creek. Uh, City of Austin and the Waterloo Conservancy has really started to try and amp up their 
efforts to make Waller Creek throughout downtown someplace that is more interactive and not a place that people go to hide or you know get away from everyone. Um, and so just south of our site, the new Waterloo Park is being built and that's um, supposed to be finished sometime this year. Um, and so that will connect to our site and you will literally have 10 blocks of native landscape um, and site certified style of landscape to where we have tried to restore the corridor to its original uh, Waller Creek splendor. Um, so the, uh, during the Waller Creek um, restoration, 70% of the plant removal was invasive. Um, so that when they went in, they pulled out as many plants as they possibly could that were not generally meant for a Texas landscape. Um, some chemicals were used, but we tried to remediate as much as we could with certain things like biochar, um, charcoal remediation methods. Um, and that's part of what our site is about, is to study the ability to be able to use certain chemicals. Uh, and I'd like to blanket statement that the University of Texas has stopped using glyphosates as of two years ago. We still use various, uh, various sprays and various chemicals, but they are as little chemical imprint as possible. Um, we do our research and, and I'd like to make a blank, blanket statement on chemicals right now is about that there are certain things in our landscape that we cannot remove organically. When you're speaking of Bermuda, when you're speaking of Nutsedge, these things have, over the years, I'm sure everyone in this room has dealt with them at some point. That is an, it is an incredibly hard plant to be able to remove and that it, it is, extracts minerals and nutrients from other plants, which makes it difficult for you to have a nat native landscape. So when it comes down to certain types of invasives, we do use chemicals, but we are very responsible. We use them as, as uh, directed by any kind of um, license that we have attained. And we really just try and use the little amount as possible. Um, all of our plant, plant material was sourced within Texas. Um, most of it was sourced within 200 miles. And um, the way that we did that, what if invasive plants and trees have you removed? So um, basically the general plants and invasives that we removed are ligustrums, um, arundo, uh, bamboo. We've removed an entirely large amount of bamboo. Um, I mean, basically anything that you can think of in the rip riparian environment. And this can also include things that people may have planted in their gardens or whatever later up down the line. Uh, we get a lot of... Uh, watermelon vine, uh, uh, sorry, it's cucamelon, cucamelon vine. Um, that's a big one. Um, sticky weed, which is also sticky willy. Uh, there's a couple other names for it. Um, basically, when it comes to invasives and we're removing any invasives from our environment, we try and do it seasonally. When you come down to things like false carrot, when you do, false carrot generally owns, only has like a two to three month window where it's really producing a lot of false carrot. Whereas you have things like crabgrass or jungle rice grass or barnyard grass, and those can produce seeds for multiple months, anywhere from six months to 10 months. So we have a, a projected plan that each year we have certain things that we go after during a certain time of the year. Um, and then that way it helps us to reduce the amount of those plants that exist later on in the year. Um, so each invasive, uh, there's so many different ones that we have a, a projected IPM plan to be able to take care of those invasives as efficiently as possible during the time period when they're producing the most offspring or they're making themselves the most relevant. Uh, sorry, most relevant. Um, is, there an ex is there an invasive species management plan for the UT system? Yes, there is. Um, so the invasive species management plan for the UT system is broad and we are limited on the amount of people that we have, um, but we do try and stay on top of certain things that we know that will cause us more problems than others. Um, and again, like sometimes we have very selective chemicals. So like for Nutsedge, we use a chemical called Certainty. It has the very smallest chemical imprint that we have found out of all of our products that we might possibly be able to use. And so it's the same thing with everything. We really try and find something that is very selective, that handles only that invasive directly, and so that, that way we don't uh, invade or 
compromise the um, the soil or the plant material around it. The more that we can save, um, the more that we can and project. Um, let's see if I can get back to that one question. I'm sorry. Participants. Uh, more chat. What about limiting the amount of space for lawn, which does not support insects, birds, etc.? Okay, so that's actually a very broad question that I have been working on for years. Um, that yes, like lawn and turf is something that we know doesn't actually do any good whenever it's supporting the surrounding biology or environmental system. Um, however, we have been around longer than the city of Austin. And so when you're talking about the university and how long or how broad they've been able to project lawn, often it is the architect for the building that decides the architecture for the landscape. Generally, when you're building a project, you have the landscape architect, then you have the civil engineer and the owner. And so the landscape, landscape architect has to generally report to the uh, civil engineer or the owner. And that often makes it to where doing things either more economically or more ecologically is very difficult. So fortunately with this project, we had a little bit different case um, and I'm gonna try and continue on. So wood from the site that was reused to make furniture, desk and other products. So any trees that we cut down, they were reused for things from pens to picture frames to pews in the chapel for the hospital to coasters to anything that you can possibly think of. We have a very broad um, uh, department for carpentry. And so we have all of our wood milled that comes from the site and then it's brought back to the university and then our carpenters make it into all different kinds of materials so that that way we can um, redistribute the, the wood that comes from the site and be used somewhere else rather than just thrown into the, the land, landfill or the dump. So when I say 26% of the cost of reused plants and materials comes from a lot of our heritage trees removed as well as a lot of our plant material that we could save was extracted from the site and then saved. Um, okay, so real quick, we've had one uh, what is the cost-wise good grass seed for San Antonio area that isn't a water waster? Uh, um, so generally, if we're speaking about central Texas, uh, one of the best grasses that you can possibly use is buffalo grass. Um, generally, it's hard for grass and seed for that to grow from buffalo, but buffalo now comes in a pallet version to where you can purchase it in a already pre-cut pallet so that that way it's easier for your buffalo grass to take. Um, and I would highly recommend it because seeding buffalo grass is incredibly um, labor intensive because you have to keep all of the weeds and everything out of there while it's growing. But once you get your buffalo grass established, which is super native to Texas, especially central Texas. Um, now there are other grasses that are considered native to Texas, even St. Augustine, which is, it's considered more of a coastal grass though. So when it started, it was more considered towards Galveston area, um, Padre Island, things like that, um, simply because it, was, it could handle the high salts and it could handle a high amount of water, which now we understand that St. Augustine in the Austin area requires an enormous amount of water, um, but it is, it is often very cheap for us to buy upfront. Um, so continue on, let's go ahead to the next slide. Buffalo grass does not tolerate foot traffic very well. Unfortunately, it, it can though, I, I should take that back. It can if you establish it for several years up front. Um, I started my uh, landscaping career in Lubbock, Texas, and I had a customer who she had buffalo grass and she treated it more like a sports turf than she did more of just like a regular front yard grass. So she fertilized four times a year. She watered the crap out of it. And I will be honest that it was probably one of the best looking lawns that we mowed whenever I was in Lubbock. Um, but it takes a lot of upfront um, cost and care before it can become extremely vir virulent for foot traffic. So if you had the ability to close off an area for the first couple of years with buffalo grass, then it could very well work. 
But um, if you're dealing with a highly trafficked area or you know, some place where you have, I've never tried blue grama grass. That's more of a northern grass as much as I understand. So that might be something more for winter style. Um, but as far as Texas grasses go, buffalo, um, Bermuda, as much as I hate to say it, but if you go with something like a celebration Bermuda, it doesn't seed out, it only spreads by rhizome. So that, that way you have a very, very virulent grass that won't spread outside of the areas that you decide to keep it in. Um, so two million of our budget was moved, uh, was used for moving 12 of our heritage trees. Originally it was 13 trees, um, but one of them during the move, the root ball was um, very fragile and filled with fungus. And so the tree split in half. And just recently, about a month ago, one of the larger her heritage trees that we had also split in half just from stress and um, the recent amount of rain that we've had and things like that. But the tree itself has survived. Um, so out of the 12 heritage trees we've moved, all 12 are still going on four years later. And we will continue to take care of those trees. We work with Davy Tree Company and a couple other companies to make sure that those trees are going to survive, hopefully for at least another one or 200 years. 68% um, of our materials for the project were regional. So that's when I talk about, um, we were sourcing most of our plants from um, local growers and local greenhouses. Um, and so, Largely, the reason that we did that and including the 100% of demolished materials reduced on other sites within 50 miles, uh, the, the fact was fuel costs. Um, the more that you have to pay to have things br brought to you or moved outside of the site, the more that we are demolishing or causing damage to our outside environment. So we really tried to keep everything as close to the site as we possibly could. Um, and that includes our having all electric equipment. Um, we have now had electric equipment for four years. It has more than paid for itself. A uh, statistic for you is this last year, we used three gallons of gasoline for our entire project. Um, whereas a, another crew, I run multiple crews on the site uh, on University of Texas. So my other crew who has six people, um, we ended up using 375 gallons for a year because we used all gas equipment. So really looking at that, that means that us transferring to electric equipment allowed us to use 1% of the fossil fuels that you normally would. And the fact that the university produces all of its own fuel from um, natural gas and we are converting all of our garages slash our recharging ability for our electric equipment to solar panels using green fee equipments and uh, sorry, green fee funds that are provided to us through the university. Uh, so hopefully within the next two or three years, all of our electric equipment will be recharged um, by solar panels that are on all of our parking garages. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so from the start, we were, this is, this is the difference that I was talking about to where the landscape architect normally has to report to the civil engineer and the owner. In our case, the landscape architect and the civil engineer were equal on the playing board. So anytime they were like, we're going to plant this oak two feet from the building, we could say no you're not gonna plant an oak tree two feet from a building because in 10 years, we're gonna be butchering that tree to keep it off of the building. Or if they planted muley too close to, too close to the grass, or, or sorry, to the sidewalk, or if there was too many invasives and plants that they brought in, we could go in and say this, this plant uh, palette is not acceptable for our site. So um, we used the Siglo group, which is an ecologist group, um, and the gentleman to the front in the hard hat, not scratching his head, was the, was the guy who helped us out through the site. And they thoroughly documented. They would process every week. We would get a weekly report about um, this site has Bermuda in it. This site has nutsedge in it. This plant material does not look like it's up to par. Um, this tree is not up to caliper. Um, so we had the ability to be able to check all of the plant material, all of the soil material, uh, anything that was coming into the site that was not supposed to be there or that was supposed to be there, we had the chance to be able to, why, why can't we seem to, oh, sorry, 
um, trying to an answer chats at the same time. So why can't we seem to acquire citrus trees for growth in Texas like orange? Um, I'm not going to be the person, I'm going to be honest. I don't know too much about trees or citrus trees, um, but I would, assume, I would assume it is because citrus trees are generally more uh, acclimated to acidic soils, whereas we have a lot more alkaline soils because of our limestone underground. And so generally when you're growing citrus trees in central Texas, you require a lot more of an acidic fertilizer or soil to add to those trees. Um, whereas like down towards the coast, since we have much more saltier soils and things like that, um, citrus trees are probably more easy, easy, easily grown because of their ability to have a more acidic soil down south. Um, so, okay, uh, next slide. Training. Training is incredibly important for all of our crew. Um, when my crew was brought on, when I was originally brought, in, brought on, it was just me and it was during the construction project and a lot of it was me still working on main campus, but still working with the um, contractors to be able to get the site right. So when I started to be able to bring my crew on, there was important trainings that I made a requirement for them to be able to get the job. And one of them was, be, was to get all three levels of their native plant certification, as well as we worked with um, native plant gurus. That's Bill Carr in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, we worked with the Siglo group. We worked with the Wildflower Center, um, with the, um, the, um, uh, sorry, their name forget, for, slips me for the mind. But basically, we, we really spent a lot of additional money on being able to train our people. Um, we're not the straightforward mow, blow, and go operation. We started with 50 different planted and seeded native plants. And at this point, we're well over 200 different species in our district. And as many of you may know, a lot of our juvenile grasses, whether they be invasive or native, look fairly the same. So being able to train your people to know the difference between what is an invasive plant and what is an, a native plant, what do we want in our landscape and what is going to be a problem was something that we wanted to get out in front of. You wanna be able to identify a problem before it becomes a problem. And so training people to be able to identify those problems is a really big deal. And so the, the um, luxury of being in a, do you have any recommendations regarding, um, sorry, the luxury of being in a university is that we encourage people to grow by education. So we'll pay for ACC classes, we'll pay for people to get their native plant certification, they paid for me, paid for me to get my um, uh, organic accreditation, as well as my pesticide license and everything that I could possibly imagine to be able to do my job better. We're lucky to be able to, to be at a environment that encourages people to learn how to do their job better. Um, and so training was just incredibly important and I continue to encourage it. Any new people that come on, um, as well as I've been starting to take over other parts of campus. And so those crews are now also being required to take native plant certification and be able to learn about soil and learn about composting and what's going on in your soil and the life that goes on inside of it. And so really training and education is an incredibly large part of what we do in the medical district and now starting to spread out throughout the rest of campus and the other crews and teams that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is our tool room. We call it the armory. Um, really the only piece of gas powered equipment we have is that spreader sprayer on the right, which spreads our organic fertilizer and some of our compost teas, as well as we have an aerator, but everything else is electric powered. Uh, from our chainsaws, to our weed eaters, to our blowers, to our hedge trimmers, uh, anything that you can think of that comes in electric, we had the opportunity to be able to buy electric. And so the way that this worked was, Generally, when you have a new project come online, they give you a budget for whoever installed the project will take care of the project thereafter for either a 90 day up to a three year uh, term or lease. Um, the problem we found with this in the past is that when you pay someone up front for a multiple year project, 
they are generally just trying to get the minimum amount of the job done. Um, and so when we receive a project after three years of the minimum amount done, it's already gone to crap. Um, and so in this project, we were lucky that we said, you know what, we just want a 90 day contract and then we'll take that other large amount of money that we would have paid them for, to do the contract and we will pay for training. We will pay for equipment. We will pay for anything we need to, to get our site and our people ready to be able to do this job correctly. And so we were lucky again to be able to call that contract short. So, and, and even when the contract started for that first three months, we already had the crew on staff. So they were working side by side with the contractor to be able to go ahead and establish what kind of rules and, and uh, regulations we wanted to have in place for the landscape and techniques we wanted to use, things like that. And so it was a, it was a great learning experience for us up front that we are now continuing to use throughout the university that whenever we receive a new building and there's a landscape contract involved that we take the shortest possible contract so that we can use that money for training and for equipment to get our team ready to take care of the site properly. Um, next slide, please. These are some more pictures of our electric equipment on the right side, very far right side. That was one of the first electric ride on mowers. Um, I, can I can mow for five hours straight, charge it for an hour, mow for another four hours. We don't generally use this a lot on the site that we have now, um, but we'd like to use it throughout the university. The difference by using electric equipment is that there is not the same sound regulations. So back in the day when people were still living in, in dorms, which they're not living in there right now um, because of the current situation, but um, we used to have an eight o'clock uh, you couldn't start mowing until 8, you can start using power equipment until 8 o'clock, but with electric equipment, especially during dead weeks, whenever we have finals, whenever we have students inside of classrooms and things like that, being able to use electric equipment is key, uh, especially that our, our um, finals and the dead weeks and everything generally happen a week or two before graduation, which is considered our showtime. That's when you know we want our landscape to look the absolute best so that whenever the graduating students are out there taking pictures and enjoying their time with their family that they can really enjoy the landscape. Because um, let's be honest, the tower is the second most photographed uh, piece of history in Texas. And so the landscape that stands in front of the tower, no matter how far back you stand, uh, is is um, very important, especially to a lot of the students that spend an enormous amount of money to be there. They like to have a very beautiful backdrop. And so whenever it comes down to graduation, that's our showtime. And having the electric equipment has really made the difference in us being able to get the job done without disturbing anyone while they're studying and finishing up their final exams. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some a little bit before and after pictures and nor the gentleman on the left side. Um, so as you can see, during the construction of the project on the left side, you can see that they turned Waller Creek into a road. So one of the requirements of our soil was that you could not drive a certain uh, weight of equipment onto the landscape because it would cause too much compaction. And so there were rules about where they could drive certain piece of, pieces of equipment. So during the project, they literally pumped Waller Creek from 18th Street all the way down to 15th Street so that that area could be used as a road for them to transport materials. And then they eventually dredged it out and we've spent time rebuilding and rejuvenating that area. The picture on the right really does not give it justice. Um, at this point, four years later, we have a lot of black willow. We have a lot of various other riparian plants that are growing Texas uh, river sedge. Um, just any, any plant that you can think of that would grow inside of the riparian area, we let grow uh, in addition to trying to keep out as many invasives as, as we can, China berry, ligustrum. Um, you know, there's multiple other ones that come from further up the creek that we cut on a regular basis and we treat very seriously so that that way we try not to invade other parts down the creek. Um, next slide, please. So on the left here, you can see one of my classes. Um, we get a lot of volunteers that come down and we get to be able to teach them about Waller Creek and everything that's going on. 
So the right picture there kind of shows a little bit more about how the creek has started to grow in. About we've had a lot more plant material start to move in to the area and this is very important to us. We even plant additional plant material down into Waller Creek because we've learned a lot about flood mitigation and that plant material is the best filter for any water that comes off the surface. If you know anything about flood mitigation and, and uh, floodplains and our watershed is that the Austin area has a very large watershed that leaks down into several different creeks and then eventually down into the areas that we all enjoy for our rec recreational activities. So being able to add additional plant material into Waller Creek hopefully allows us to reduce the amount of silt, to, uh, to reduce the amount of E. coli and various other bacteria and diseases that might get into the water um, because we're really trying to be good stewards for our creeks to improve their health so that people later down the line that are enjoying those water sources don't get sick um, just because of the things that have been going on. Uh, next slide please. Um, here's another real quick shot. So left side there's the road. And if you kind of look towards the middle top of the picture, you can see the pipeline that was pumping the water around to the other side of Waller Creek. And then on the right side, this was actually about two years ago that this was taken to where they had dredged the, dredged the creek, removed the road, and that was the original source back to Waller Creek. Um, it is very well more grown in now. Um, I, I kind of need to replace my pictures. But this shows that the road is gone now and Waller Creek is back to what it normally would be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, composting was part of our site cert certification. Um, and so real quick on site certification, sites is like leads for buildings, but it's specifically for landscape. So basically when you get your site certification, you're trying to do as little damage to the environment as possible and the most rejuvenating um, to the environment that is possible. And so there's lots of different points, just like for buildings that you would get, but for landscaping. So being able to use uh, no chemicals, the electric equipment, the ability to collect rainwater, make your own compost. So starting here, this was uh, to the left picture. When I started 12 years ago, this is what our compost pile looked like on a regular basis. Um, it was basically we brought all the leaves that came off of campus and just piled them in, in a big pile. And then when that pile got too big, we unfortunately would start putting them into trash cans and then we would get it carried off to the dump. So within the last year and a half, I have really amped up our compost operation. And so here on the right side, you can see that we are starting to mix and make our own compost. So um, I collect, used to collect all of the coffee grounds off, compost, uh, off of the campus. Um, and that has recently stopped. So I've been working with a couple of breweries that are around town um, to get their mash to be able to put into our compost piles as well as the daycares and various other facilities that are still manufacturing food. We get their vegetable scraps and anything that's carb related and put that into the compost pile. And then we recently got a rainwater system installed back at our shop so that we can water it with rainwater. Um, and that helped me to make my compost tea and various other things. We also water all of our plants in our greenhouses. Um, we have four greenhouses back at campus and all of our plant material is now grown inside of those plant, uh, inside of those greenhouses for the entire campus. So we generally do not outsource any of our plant material. We have now been able to start growing our own plant material to keep it all in-house. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is progressing on that. So on the left side, this is me collecting coffee grounds. They would generally put them in five gallon buckets or 50 gallon drums. My record week was one ton of coffee grounds in one week. Um, and that was during finals and during the winter time. And I assume that that was because there was a lot of students drinking coffee to stay awake and be able to study for their finals. Um, in the middle, uh, so this is, I get the privilege of being able to go to the daycares on campus and one time a year I get to teach all of the students about the benefits of composting and the importance of composting and then we go out to their student gardens and we replace their soil with compost and they learn that all of their vegetable scraps and things that they don't eat from their meals every day go into buckets in each room and then they are provided to us to be able to make them compost and then we bring that compost back to their gardens so that they can learn again and plant new vegetables for the next year. 
Um, and so I'm going to be honest, that is one of my favorite parts of my job is being able to go work with all of the students. Those kids are smarter than any of us by far. There are some of them that know things about compost that I didn't even know existed whenever I was their age. So it is, it is a enlightening experience to be able to go to the daycares and work with the children and the teachers and, and be able to teach the next generation about why it's so important that we use compost and re we recycle materials and plants and things like that. On the right side, so this is what prompted us to really amp up our compost game. So spring break of last year, all of our heavy equipment operators were out working on the East Mall doing a project. So for the entire week of spring break, all of our bags of trash slash leaves came back here to this one pile right here. And nobody had the heavy equipment to put it in that dumpster right to the right. So I took the initiative, went out there and started separating which bags were leaves and usable material for compost and which bags were actually trash. So out of 323 bags, 314 of them were leaves and compostable materials. We pay 30 cents per bag, as well as 480 something dollars to get that dumpster taken away. So after you did the math, we were paying literally almost $700 every time we got this taken off for 14 bags of trash, whereas the rest was leaves and compostable material. So with a very short presentation to our leadership, they allowed me to buy, we have leaf mulch, mulching machines now, and these machines are capable of making 15 bags of uncrushed leaves into one bag of crushed material. And so by using the, these leaf machines, we've now been able to reduce the amount that we send to the dump. So two years ago, we were, spent, we were sending around 60 tons of material to the dump. And there's no way for me to prove it, but I'm pretty sure a large majority of that was leaves. So this year that we've done the new calculations, we are only sending around 14 tons of material to the dump, removing all of the leaves and compostable material that we would have sent to the dump. And now we're able to compost to that and turn it into usable material. So we have a screener, we have a sifter, um, so basically we compost all, all our material, uh, add all of the ingredients together, and then after three or four months, we put it into the sifter and we now have material that is store bought quality to be able to use throughout campus. Uh, next slide, please. So this is further carrying on with compost. The right picture is our finished product of after our leaves and everything that comes in, that's the compost that we have left. On the left side, I wanted to show that we use the PHRP, we use the pathogen, sorry, PRHP, pathogen reducing heat process. So I monitor the temperature on all of our compost piles um, to make sure that it reaches at least 131 degrees. And whenever you do this, this makes sure that you are eliminating all of your weed seeds. If you have any pre-emergence or any chemicals that might've been added to any, any of the plant material, this allows that to burn off as well as keeping all of the good microbiology inside of your compost going so that that way it's degrading the material that much faster and it's able for you to be used. Um, and so by doing this, we can make sure that no matter what we put into our compost piles, that the product that we use elsewhere on campus is not bringing more problems to our site uh, when it comes to certain types of weeds that can survive higher temperatures. Um, so by me monitoring, by me using just rainwater to split the piles, um, and using only certain amendments. Um, that way we can make sure we come out with a very valid, good product that's better than anything that we could buy in the stores. Uh, next slide, please. Compost tea. So this is an addition to our compost. Um, so because I make our own compost, we actually have certain piles that are considered our quote unquote choice piles where I only put in organic ingredients, no weeds, no seeds, no anything that we wouldn't want. And so with this, uh, last year I, create, I produced over 7,000 gallons of compost tea. Um, I'm not allowed to call it UT anymore because of some legalities with athletics, blah, 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 it's a bunch of crap, but 
anyways, I thought it was clever. And so our tea can be geared towards a soil soak. It can be made into a foliar spray. It can be made into a bloom booster for flowering plants. If you have a freeze warning and you're worried about your plants getting freezed, use extra molasses and extra seaweed. If you're worried about your plants um, going through a drought to where they're gonna um, have additional days of heat, there's other recipes for that as well to be able to make different types of compost, compost tea for different situations. And so we've used it throughout our site and then with the popularity and people seeing how well it does in our site, they've started to use it throughout campus. So, you know, if we have a tree that's failing or if we have a new planting or if we have areas of turf that are struggling because there's a lot of turf damage um, and traffic that's going on, there's multiple different types of compost teas that you can make. There's recipes all out there. Um, I use uh, Elaine Ingram's. Um, books for compost tea, active aerated compost tea. She has a field guide one and two that is just amazing with a whole bunch of different recipes as well as if you just do some due diligence on the internet, you can find a whole bunch of different, where can one purchase an implement to gauge compost? Uh, Amazon, I bought mine on Amazon. It was a little bit expensive just because it was a six foot thermometer. Um, and you generally want a thermometer that can reach down to the center of your pile. Um, so I just bought the analog version, but they have versions that connect to your smartphone and can send you emails and tell you the salinity level and the moisture level in the soil as well, in addition to temperature. Um, you know, it, it gauges from anywhere from $50 up to several thousand dollars, depending on what kind of gauge you want to get into and, and how deep into the business you are. Um, because once you start really getting into compost production, you want to make sure that you are eliminating all of the bad guys and keeping a lot of the good guys. Um, so basically, you just want a very long, good uh, thermometer that can at least reach up to the 140 degree range. Uh, but if you can't afford a thermometer, generally a good rule of thumb is that if you just shove your arm down into the pile and if it is too hot for you to keep your arm in the pile, it's probably too hot for anything to be able to survive. Um, so with our compost teas, uh, especially like if I'm doing a winter brew or something like that, I do have um, thermometers, fish tank thermometers that keep uh, the temperature up high, sorry, fish tank heaters that keep the temperature up high enough to be able to produce the uh, variable amount. So when you're thinking about compost tea, you're basically taking your compost, which in a handful of compost, there is more life than there is on the planet Earth. And so if you take that compost and put it into a tea bag and then start fermenting it in a larger container and you add a source of sugar, which in our case we use molasses, um, that allows all of the life that, it is, it, that is inside that compost to procreate inside of the water. And as long as you keep that temperature up and you keep it oxygenated, in our case we use a very large turbine that keeps it filled up um, with oxygen and then that way you are making sure that when you apply your compost tea it has the absolute most amount of life. So when you're thinking of compost and compost tea don't think of it as a fertilizer. It is more along the lines of a biological inoculant. You are adding more life to whatever the process might be. So if you're doing a soil soak, if the plant is a factory and through photosynthesis, it creates sugar that it exudes through its roots. And generally, plants will exude 80% of its sugar through its roots. And the reason it does that is because it's trying to build up the biology in the soil. And by feeding that biology, they can lead that plant through fungal uh, mycorrhizal expansion to be able to find um, like mines and points to where they can get the nutrients that they need to survive. And so when the plant says, I need nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or any, any of the ingredients that it might need, the microbiology can make that exchange. And usually they make that exchange for sugar. So the more sugar that the plant can put out, the better that, that the biology and the soil will be able to provide it with what they want. So if the plant is the factory and you're flooding it with compost tea, Basically think of it as you're flooding the factory floor with cheap labor and at that point all of that labor is competing to be able to get those nutrients to and from the plant. 
So the more labor you have, the more people you have on the factory floor, the better that the plant will survive and be able to provide those things. So compost tea, again, is not a fertilizer. It is more along the lines if you are adding life. So if you were using it as a foliar spray, you spray the leaves of the plant with these living organisms. And then when the pathogens show up, when the bad guys show up to invade the plant, it's almost like they walk into that bar and then the record scratches and all the good guys look up and they're like, hey, what are you doing here? We've already got this space occupied. And the bad guys generally can't handle what's already there. And so compost tea is a really good way to protect your plant foliarly, uh, on the stem, from the soil. It is just a good way to flood good life and good production value into whatever you're doing. If you were thinking of it along the lines of a building, a building would not be able to stand without a good foundation. So soil is a foundation for plants, and so the stronger the foundation you have, the better that all of your plant material will be able to survive and handle the problems that come along. Next slide, please. So here on the left, you can see where I added a little too much life to my compost tea. Um, that was because I added some additional molasses because we were, we were gonna be gone for an additional day. And so that's what happens whenever you have lots of life inside of your compost tea is that it foams up and that the bacterial inoculation inside of the tea will start to foam over. Um, that is actually usable material. Uh, we don't ever actually use it, but it's, it's always an intense sight to see. Um, and on the right side, me advertising my UT um, being used by the tower because we used on some of our award winning, winning grass. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, we are an all native site and I actually need to take back that we are an all organic site because we do use chemicals occasionally. And I will go back to my blanket statement about chemicals is that sometimes you get things in your landscape that are incredibly difficult to remove organically and it will cost you a lot of money it will cost you a lot of labor and a lot of time and so my analogy is that if you get cancer in real life is that sometimes you have to use chemicals you have to use chemotherapy to be able to get rid of that cancer but we have techniques and we have the ability um, by using things like biochar and charcoal resonated sources that they can absorb chemicals and help remediate your soil that much faster. And so a lot of what we do is an experiment to say, if we treat this area, one, we have the ability to keep people out of it because nobody's supposed to be walking around inside of our landscapes. Um, and, two, and two, it it allows us to be able to contain the situation to where it does not affect anything outside of its area. So. I would like to say that we are 100% organic, but we are not, that we occasionally have problems. And generally, I will speak sp specifically, those problems are Nutsedge and Bermuda. Everything else we've really been able to <laughs> take care of organically, but Nutsedge and Bermuda have been one of our hardest things to ever be able to take care of. Uh, next slide, please. These are just more um, slides of what our landscape looks organically. Um, and on the right side, I'd like to point out, if you look at the bricks that are on the ground, those are pervious pavers. So there is no grout in between those bricks and surrounded throughout our site, we have this style of bricks um, to where any rainwater that lands on those percolates directly back down into the soil instead of being sheeted off into other areas. Um, I'm sure we've all learned about prairies and the importance that they are basically giant sponges. And so even if it were to sheet off of that area, we are surrounded by prairies, but this was just another way for us to add another additional step to being able to remediate floodwaters and collect as much down into the soil as possible. Um, so on the left side, those were originally blue stems. Uh, you're fine, go back. Um, th those were originally blue stems, and in, in this case, now we are reformatting them to be wildflower beds this next year. Um, generally what happens is the first year you've got a lot of wildflowers, the second year you've got a lot of bunch grasses, and then the third year we seem to have a lot of invasives. So <laughs> we've been on this three-year cycle of really just trying to be able to keep everything as native as possible. Um, one of our big problems is that um, we are surrounded by invasives. 
Uh, if you think about all of the state buildings around us, they're all common Bermuda. I-35 has got a lot of uh, um, blue stem in there that is, is not, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, and of course it's slipping my mind. But basically, we are a fire of natives on a wooden boat in a lake of invasives. We are in the center of an, of an urban environment to where everything around us, including Waller Creek, brings in just a large amount of invasives for us all the time. And so no matter how well we keep our invasives out, there will always be more. And I'm not speaking down on any sites like the Wildflower Center or anything like that, but the Wildflower Center is out in the middle of a large prairie of mostly native plants and they don't have a lot of invasive species and they have a large army of volunteers that help them with that. I have six people for eight acres um, and we do the best we can. KR Blue Stem is the one I was thinking of that is a very uh, invasive that we find on a regular basis. And so throughout all of those invasive species, we do the best that we can and I really like to think that our, our site is well. Uh, a sign, uh, sorry, a question that I just got was, do you have someone assigned to paver maintenance or is there low need? So uh, within the four years now, we have yet to need anyone to do any kind of paver maintenance. However, there has recently been discussion about how we need to go in with some crushed limestone and brush it in between the pavers again, just because over the years of us blowing it out with blowers, uh, rainwater, you know, just various elements, um, that does wash out the inside and then you eventually start to get imperfections in the uh, flatness of the pavers. And so it hasn't been done yet, but it is in the plan that we are supposed to at some point brush in crushed limestone to fill in the paver gaps. Uh, next slide, please. This is another just shot of some of the native material that we have around. That's the same paver pathway that you see on the left. And this is some Mexican honeysuckle. And actually, that's not there anymore. They, on the right side where you see the windows, they, when they built the building, they forgot to put fire exits on the back part of the building. And so they have come in and they've torn out all of our Mexican honeysuckle and basically that entire half of the building because they needed to put in fire escapes and ADA ramps. So hopefully that area will be back up to its glory and its splendor soon. Um, but that was one of those original architectural ideas that somehow slipped through the cracks and somebody forgot that being able to escape a fire was important. So, you know, the plants fail. <laughs> On the right side here, you see a little bit along Waller Creek. There's some, it um, uh, looks like some blue stem, uh, silver tip blue stem. Um, and various other, there's a red bud in there. Like basically that was a site that has grown very well for us right next to Waller Creek. All native as well. Next slide, please. Seed collection is very important. Um, every year, anytime any of our plants are going to seed, we collect and redistribute as many of them as possible, as well as we have our four greenhouses. Um, and so they grow any plant material we might need or that they want to be able to use elsewhere on campus. Um, if everybody knows, seeds are very expensive. Um, a ounce of blueberry seeds is 40 something dollars. And so we do our best to be able to reuse a lot of our seed material throughout campus and regrow plant material. Uh, and as you can see on the right slide, I use the finest of seed sorters. They make sure that I get the top quality ingredients. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So this was one of our attempts at being uh, organic when we got invaded. This is on the corner of 15th and Trinity. This was originally a prairie that was filled with wildflowers and then the second year it was filled with grasses. And then the third year we had gotten just super invaded by a whole bunch of different materials. So I got this idea from Disney and the way that Disney operates their parks when they are exchanging plant material is that all of their plant beds and all of their flower beds are pre-potted. And so whenever a plant starts to fail, they simply pull that one plant, they take it back to their greenhouse to rehabilitate it, and they replace it with another plant. And then that way their, greenhouse, their flower beds are always 100% immaculate. So I didn't take this exactly to heart, but what we did here on the right side was we dug out all of the invasive material. We pulled the plant material that we could save dug out all of the roots the best that we could, and then we replanted that material. And then, next slide, please. 
And then we covered the entire area with very thick single grind mulch. And then slowly but surely, we planted islands of native material, seeded it as well as planted material that we got from our greenhouse. And what that allowed us to do was to do the same thing that was, Disney was doing is that it gave us kind of a container situation where we had small islands of growth and if that one island got invaded by something, we would simply redo that one island instead of having to redo the entire corner. Um, and on the right side, as you can see, slowly but surely, it started to all grow back in with native plant material. And then that way we didn't have to fight the invasives other than just within the individual plots that we were planting. And whenever we dug all of this up, we used a propane push torch as well as a, a small amount of tilling to be able to literally sterilize the soil from an, as much invasive material as possible. Uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Next slide, please. This is one of uh, the chemicals that we would use and we do label vinegar as a chemical. This is 20% vinegar. Um, it took me a long time to be able to find a supplier that could get it to us in bulk. So vinegar is great. Um, it, only kills topically. It will not kill the root of any plant unless you soak the soil, which in that case you probably don't want to do. However, vinegar has a very quick turnaround rate to where you can replant the area usually within seven to 10 days. So we use this a lot for our seeding plants, for spurges, for crabgrass, for anything that has a seed and generally spreads by seed because vinegar chemically can burn those seeds. Now, I want to be very specific that you need to treat vinegar like any other chemical, that when you start getting into the 20% range, that vinegar can burn you. It might not burn you right away, but you'll get a tingling sensation in the beginning. I have made the mistake of sitting on a five-gallon bucket that had a hole punched in the top, and it got all over my pants, and it was not okay. <laughs> so I would like to point out that you need to treat vinegar like any other chemical. Wear protective gloves, wear a face mask, you know, keep yourself away from it as much as possible. Pay attention to drift because it, it is not, uh, it is non-selective. It will kill anything that it touches. And so just be sure that when using anything above 20%, and you can buy this at Home Depot or at any of your local gardening shops. Uh, generally, I think it's around 10 to $12 for a gallon. Um, and this is, it's very useful in your garden simply because it doesn't affect the soil quality. It will kill the plant and then it will degrade in the sun or degrade by oxygen and gas off. Um, and usually the worst symptom is that your yard smells like fish and chips for a little while. Uh, but vinegar is a very good tool for us to be able to remove invasives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the next things that we use is flame torches. We use propane. Um, so we have backpacks, we have cane torches, and then on the right side, so that's that same site on 15th and Trinity where we were rehabilitating the soil from invasives. So as you can see, the guys are there with tilling forks and basically they would till up the soil six to eight, eight inches down and then the, then the gentleman with the flame torch would just move it back and forth and literally just torch the entire area. So the thing with this, whenever you do that, you wanna be sure to re-inoculate your soil. So after you're done sanitizing the area with fire, you want to add a compost or a compost tea or some kind of inoculant to be able to bring the soil back to life. But we found that this actually had a very good um, outcome when it came to things like Bermuda and it came to things like crabgrass because it was burning it down to the root and it was burning all the seeds as well. So fire is a great way um, to take care of things. However, make sure that there's not any HOA regulations. Fortunately, UT is private property. So all I had to do was get with our local fire department, which is UT fire department. Um, and they gave me several regulations, you know, have water source right there nearby. Make sure that someone is always, if you can see in the background on the right picture, there's a gentleman there with a, uh, a hose. And so he was there just in case anything caught on fire to just drench the heck out of it, run your sprinkler systems afterwards. We had one or two inc incidents where the fire department was called by someone inside of a building because they smelled smoldering material. And of course, since we had already called it in, it was okay, but 
you want to be sure that whenever doing burning that you alert everyone around you that that's what you're doing and that they are okay with it because let's be honest our whole project was over five billion dollars and if i was to catch a building on fire they would be very very upset with me so fire is great but again take great care and use it responsibly uh, next slide <clears throat> so this is us going into controlled burning since we didn't have the ability to burn an entire field at once being in an urban environment what I did is I bought, um, those are ash cans. So basically, <clears throat> if you have a fireplace or you have a grill, um, you buy these cans to be able to throw your coals in or your fireplace embers in afterwards so that they don't continue to burn. So I cut the bottom out of the bottom of the can. And so our bunch grasses, and in this picture, we are burning blue stem. You, play, you cut it down to a certain size so that you don't have too much burnable material, and then you take the ash can and put it over the, the root ball, light it on fire, let it burn down to the crown. You don't wanna burn through the crown because then you're actually doing damage to the root of the plant, but basically you wanna burn off all the thatch. In nature, if we were to be growing bunch grasses and none of us existed and it was just the bunch grass, eventually there would be a wildfire that came along and burned off all of the extra plant material to allow the plant to be able to grow better. Um, Texas has more natural wildflowers, that, uh, wildfires than the rest of the country combined. And so our plant material is specifically acclimated to being burned every once in a while. So what we have done is we have sectioned our area off into quarters. And so once every four years, a quarter of our section, we go through with multiple different burn buckets, multiple teams, and we do as much burning as we possibly can. Um, and the way that we do it allows us to be able to do it without having the fire department present or having to follow any of the extra rules and regulations because it is a extreme controlled event. You are basically burning one plant at a time and making sure that that plant is out before you move to the next plant. Next slide, please. Freezing. So I got this idea because one year I was working one of the 40 acres events and the one of the science departments was freezing things with liquid nitrogen, hot dogs and balloons and what have you. Um, and so this student here <clears throat> poured out the leftover liquid nitrogen on top of the root ball of one of the trees in the background. And so me being a concerned landscaper, I walked over and said, hey, uh, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just pouring out this liquid nitrogen. And I said, um, you're possibly damaging the roots to this oak tree. And he was like, oh, no, 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 no. It gasses off in like two or three minutes. And I said, okay, well, but, you know, the top like four to six inches of any tree is where it gets most of its nutrients and most of its water. And so, like, I'm just having a really hard time believing that you're not damaging the tree at this point. We bantered back and forth, and it never really came of anything. However, it gave me the idea that maybe this could be useful. So this does not work during summer. Summertime weeds, if you spray them with liquid CO2 or liquid nitrogen, nine times out of 10, they're going to be very happy that you're spraying them with liquid CO2. However, you can rent a 200 gallon tank of liquid nitrogen for, eight, uh, uh, for $80. And then the filling is, I think 180 is what we paid for 200 gallons. So we use this to kill a track of bamboo. We also use this to kill a track of Nandina. So the key here is that you don't wanna to touch it. Obviously this is even more dangerous than most of the chemicals that we would use, but it works and it almost instantly gasses off while adding an additional source of nitrogen to the soil. I did a soil test to an area afterwards that we killed a track of Nandina and the nitrogen level had raised up. So. This is usable, but it's a little weird and it's mildly difficult. And so freezing is great, um, but it's generally where you have the resources and the ability to do it. This was mainly an experiment. And at this point now, um, I, I utilized um, financial resources that I was not supposed to use for liquid nitrogen. Apparently, all of our gases have to be purchased through a purchase order and there's this long line of bureaucratic stuff that I have to go through for our freezing gases. Um, so this was fun in the beginning, but we don't use it on a regular basis simply because it became kind of a bureaucratic nightmare to be able to buy liquid nitrogen to pour directly on the ground. Um, so it works, um, but you would probably have to mostly do this as a private homeowner rather than with a company or anything like that. 
Uh, next slide. Solarizing, old school technique, totally works. Uh, this was in front of the nursing building. We had an area where it was dramatically filled with weeds and invasives and things that we didn't want. Um, it was originally Habiturf and then the Habiturf failed and, and we just had a whole lot of things to come in there that we didn't want. So dug up the area, tilled it, got out all the in, uh, invasive material that we really could. And then we sealed it up for six weeks, started in um, June and ran through August of that year. And so the key here is that you want to water um, at least once a week while you're doing it. Um, but as long as your temperatures get, are getting up over 100 degrees, you can guarantee that the clear plastic that you use, and you generally want to use a opaque or clear plastic because the black plastic does not allow as much of the UV uh, through and that it does not increase the soil temperature as efficiently as the clear or the opaque does. Um, however, uh, as you can see on the right side or the bottom left hand picture, sorry, the bottom picture is where we seeded with a sun wildflower mix and it did really well. Uh, and then on the right side, we had some patrons. I'm pretty sure it was the electrical department. I'm not sure. Walk through our wildflower patch, which is, you know, always one of our things. But solarizing does work. So I do recommend to use it if you have the ability for time um, and safety. Because part of it for us was being able that we had security guards post there, posted there on a regular basis. Uh, one of my coworkers came from California and he said, you can never do anything like this laying bricks and T-posts on top of plastic overnight. They would end up through windows or whatever else. And so we were lucky to be able to have an area that was regular, regularly patrolled that we could keep the plastic laid down on the soil and not have any problems from people uh, bothering it uh, and getting the job done. Uh, next slide, please. Final ingredient, elbow grease. That's the same site where all those wildflowers were planted and then we solarized. So after we did the solarization, we still went, went in there with uh, picks and hose and everything else that we could, shovels, and dug out anything that may have possibly survived. If we thought it survived, if it even looked partially like it survived, we would rip it out and dig it out to help make sure that the, that process uh, didn't continue. And on the right side, that's our rooftop garden which we, we are still having problems with accessing. Um, so we originally had to access it early in the morning. So as you can see, we're working with headlamps there to pull weeds out of a cactus garden in the most beautiful area to pull weeds in Austin. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, so this goes back to our heritage trees. Um, remember earlier I said we spent $2 million of our budget uh, moving 12 of our heritage trees. Uh, the one on the left, unfortunately, was during a storm and it tore our tree out. This is not how we move our heritage trees. On the right side, however, is if you go to treemovers.com, they have multiple videos on how they move trees. Um, and so some of our trees on site were moved merely 60 feet. Uh, some of the trees on site were moved half a block to three quarters of a block. Um, and if you ever get a chance to see a fully matured oak tree moved, it is quite a sight. Uh, you know, all the cranes that are involved, they basically take these giant blow up long tubular canvas bags. And just like they used to move the bricks on the pyramids, they set up the tree and the tree has to be angled specifically uh, to where the sun was hitting it before. If you rotate the tree or you change the angle of where the sun hits it, it can dramatically change the way the tree goes into shock. So they keep the tree in the same angle, then they start moving it, and as they move it, they pull out the canvas bags, they unair them, then they air them back up, and then they continue to move the tree slowly but surely along these canvas bags until it gets its sight. Um, and so it is really an amazing thing to see if, you've ever, if you ever have the chance to see a heritage tree moved in real life, I recommend doing it by far. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another picture of what, what that is. On the left side, as you can see in the background, the hospital is not even built yet. And so that is Waller Creek down on the bottom, and then they, that is the heritage tree that they moved. And this is the one that they only moved 60 feet. They moved it 60 feet closer to the creek so that that way they could build the hospital and it wouldn't affect the health of the tree. Uh, and that tree is one of our champion trees at this point. We will water these trees three times a week for the next 15 years of their life. Um, we have Davy Tree Company and a couple other companies come out and check them on a regular basis to make sure that they are healthy, that they are not leaning in any way, 
Um, and these trees will be well taken care of as long as I am still at UT. Uh, next slide, please. So this goes back to our wood repurposing. Any tree that was taken off of the site was repurposed in some manner or fashion. So on the left side, this is the nursing courtyard. Um, every single bench that you see in the, in the picture was made from trees that were sourced on site. The chairs obviously are metal, um, but the stools there were also made from pecan. The middle one was made from an oak. All of the benches on the left and on the top side were made from pecan trees. The Jesus in the center pen, uh, picture, same thing, made from pecan. Um, and so this was actually an outside source, not one of our local carpenters, but everything in the chapel in the new Dell Medical Hospital um, is all repurposed wood from the pews to the holy water um, container from all of the oils. Basically everything that you see in these pictures is repurposed wood, the back wall paneling, the floors, um, Everything about that is, is all repurposed wood. And so, like I said, we went down as far as to making pins, to making coasters, picture frames, anything that we could re reuse that purpose and uh, repurpose that wood was done. Um, and we still have a lot of it on the site. So if you ever have a chance to come down, check out the chapel for sure. It's a very beautiful thing to see. Next slide. Uh, wildlife. Um, so we've had a, uh, the Texas Wildlife Association, um, a lot of uh, different groups have come down, bird watching groups. Um, so on the left there, you have a red fox, I believe, which now we have a family of red foxes. Uh, just last week, I saw mama, daddy, and four cubs. Um, and as far as I can tell, they live in our site and they're not going anywhere. Um, on the right side there, we find regular beehives in our site, being that we are a pollinator site. Um, and that is one of our irrigation hubs. Um, so inside there would be some of our control valves um, and the size of the hive that he pulled out and then removed and he took to a different location. Um, so anytime we find any bees on site, we do not eradicate them. We take their hives and take their queen and we try and move them to a different site so they can continue pollinating safely um, and doing their job for us in society. So thank you bees. Um, next slide, please. Here's some more wildlife on the left there. You can see how some of our trees, whenever they fall, they might create areas for raccoon families to move in. Um, and I think that middle slide is either a blue heron or maybe it looks like some kind of a heron. Uh, and then on the right side is a nutria. Um, and we have now have a family of nutrias that's living with us. Yes, they are invasive, but I generally don't kick out any of our new wildlife that comes into the area unless they are human. Um, but most of the time, if they're animal, I allow them to stay. Next slide, please. Um, Bioswale. So this goes back to our uh, retention ability from a storm event. Um, these two are actually terrible examples of our bioswales. These are right by the hospital. Um, all of our bioswales are supposed to be able to percolate water back down into the soil within 72 hours. These two bioswales, I have never, ever seen them empty in the four years that I have been there. And my theory is because they were built on top of a limestone slab and, and they were not drilled further down to where the material would allow the water to percolate back down. So since then, we've made some modifications to the area. They look totally different now. We basically turned them into rain gardens. So there's a lot of um, uh, horsetail reed and button bush and dogwood. Um, there's some cypress trees in there. Black willow, various plants that do well in like a riparian environment. Um, and so now we're more relying on the plant material to take care of the water rather than the ability for them to soak down into the soil. I think I might have some better bioswales in the next picture. Yes, excellent. Okay, so this is over at the Health, health Learning Building. Um, and as you can see, this is uh, the bioswale on the left and the right are the same, but I had seeded it with a shade friendly wildflower mix hoping that there wouldn't be the um, excellent amount of rain that we've got this year not that I'm complaining um, but generally our bioswells are dry and so I was trying to turn that area into more of a wildflower garden um, but this bioswell is functional so literally less than 48 hours maximum 72 hours all of the water that comes off of the Frank Irwin Center parking lot 
drains into this bioswale and then percolates back into the soil. So all of that water that comes off of the Frank Irwin Center parking lot, instead of going into Waller Creek and then draining down into Lady Bird Lake, is now percolated down into the soil and into the landscape instead of escaping down into Waller Creek in the storm system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so rainwater harvesting. Um, so we have a 27,000 gallon cistern on the health center garage, which covers the west side of the creek. So if I fill that cistern, it allows me to have two waterings. Generally, we only water one time a month, our entire landscape. Um, our landscape uses 20% of the water that a traditional landscape would use. My example that I usually give is that there is a lawn on UT campus that is eight acres of St. Augustine grass. If you know anything about St. Augustine, it takes about 80 inches a year of water to grow to its full potential. Austin generally gets 35 to 40 inches a year, which means that we have to double the amount of water that we are giving this grass for it to supplement and grow. So that eight acre landscape of St. Augustine grass last year used 4.9 million gallons of drinking water, city water, that we could bathe with, we could cook our vegetables with, blah, blah, blah. Whereas our landscape used 1.6 million gallons. And in that 1.6 million, 800,000 gallons of that was reclaimed water from the city of Austin's reclaim system. 650,000 gallons of that was rainwater that was harvested in the system that you see currently. And less than 200,000 gallons, it's actually more like 150,000 gallons of water was drinking water. So when you consider that we only used 150,000 gallons of drinking water to water our landscape for the entire year, and that other landscape I'm discussing of St. Augustine grass, same size, used 4.9 million gallons, the ability for us to retain water and reuse it and use reclaimed water and stop using our drinking water to water our landscape is very apparent in what we do in our area. And so that's a lot of what we tout is that our landscape can survive better, that it is native Texas, that it goes, and if you've lived in Texas your whole life, you know, we get five to seven years of drought, and then we get one to three years of flooding, and then we go back to five to seven years of drought. And so using our native plants, using our ability to build the soil, keeping things as organically as possible, reducing the amount of inputs that we put in, really allows for our landscape to be able to reduce the amount of water we use. So if we go into another drought like we were in 2011, I guarantee that St. Augustine is not going to look good as our landscape. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, student involvement in outside education. So multiple times a year, um, we get student groups that will come down and ask if they can help plant plant material, if they can help rem remove invasives, if they can just simply learn more about our flood mitigation or why we use native plants, um, why we've decided to use this type of landscape in a medical district and why it is so beneficial to people who are recovering from some kind of medical um, disparage that, you know, in this case, they can if I'm in a hospital, I don't necessarily want to look out on turf and trees. I, it's better than looking out on sidewalk and, and parking lot and air conditioners. Um, but there's, there is uh, qu quant Quantronics. Um, basically, they are small surveys that we give out to the people who are in the district. Um, when it comes to the nurses, when it comes to the doctors, when it comes to the people who work in the buildings surrounding our area, um, you know, there's been times that I've been sitting in the cafeteria and I hear the nurses all joking about, hey, we're going out on our walk. You should really come with us. And them utilizing that time to be able to walk through our landscape and be in an environment that you're not normally around. Like being in grass, being under trees is, is one thing and, it's, and, and it says something for what we do. But being in an environment when, where you have over 200 different styles of Texas native plants, where you have fully grown oak trees, where you have Waller Creek that runs through the center and it's clean and it's got plant material growing in it, um, you know, we, count, we uh, hear from our surrounding environment constantly where people are just walking on their break. And it's like I sit in a 
fluorescently lit screened office all day long. And so for my 15 minutes of free time, I come out here and I walk through your landscape of wildflowers and of native grasses and of birds I've never seen and be able to see Waller Creek in a way that I've never been able to see it before. And so being able to spread that to student groups and HOAs and different types of landscaping groups. We've had crews come to us to learn how to do our type of landscaping because we are very unique. We're something that doesn't exist um, a lot. And so whenever any, any educational group asks, it, it, all the way down to just two people up to, I've taken a tour of 120 people, um, just to be able to show them everything that we're doing and that it is possible. And so uh, being a university and being an educational entity um, this is a really big part of what we do is that we want to teach future, future generations from the daycares up to our students who are current to our staff and to our faculty. Um, last two weeks ago, we gave away 500 plants to the hospital and to the rest of the Dell Medical District in appreciation for everything that the healthcare workers were doing and being able to teach them about that all of their plants were organic and that we grew them ourselves. Um, this was, you, I know everyone was wearing a mask, but you could see people smiling in their eyes. You could really tell that it was bringing a, bringing a light to their day just to be able to learn that something like this was going on so close to where they work and so close to where they live, um, that that's a really big part of it is being able to teach everybody else and like we're doing right now, like I'm getting the privilege of being able to present to your Native Plant Society about what we're doing, because a lot of people don't even know we exist. And so a big part of what we do is teaching other people what we do and how it's possible. Next slide, please. I would really like to hit hard on soil testing. This is something that I try and teach all of my crews. I try and teach everybody in landscaping that I ever meet you can take care of a landscape. If we throw fertilizer 20, 20, 20, and we throw a crap load of water on something, the plant will grow. It'll be just fine. It will grow. However, you have just murdered all of the soil biology and you've done all kinds of detriments to yourself that you will slowly but surely realize as you're having, having to add more chemicals and more remediation through the years. So anytime you're doing a flower bed, anytime you're having any problems in your soil when it comes to turf or when it comes to trees or any kind of plant, testing your soil is vital because that way you know exactly what you need to add. And we do this throughout our entire area and on campus as well because there's no point in just throwing fertilizer and throwing water at something if you're starting to have problems. And, and even if you're not having problems, you should input the least amount of something possible. So whether it be water, whether it be maintenance, whether it be soil, whether it be fertilizer, you don't wanna to add too much. We've learned over the years that too much nitrogen is bad, too much phosphorus is bad, that whenever one chemical is overused, another chemical might be locked up because it's not able to be unlocked because of your overuse of another chemical. And so doing soil testing really allows us to be able to take a look at what we're dealing with so that we get the least amount of inputs into whatever we're doing. I use Texas Plant and Soil Lab. I think they're great. I get the Solvita test, but A&M does soil testing. Um, I believe Texas Tech does soil testing. There's various different entities throughout the state that can do soil testing and the cheapest tests start out at like $20 and they will give you the basics. They can even give you a recommended organic solution or a recommended chemical solution, depending on which way you go. Um, and then that way, again, you're not, you're not going in blindfolded. You're not going in to handle your problem going, I think this will work. You're going in with a piece of information that really tells you exactly what you need to add in the specified amounts so that you're not overdoing it one, to, a, to mess up your landscape, or two, for that to just leach out and you're literally throwing money into Waller Creek and you know, down into areas where we don't need additional fertilization or anything like that. So soil testing is extremely important in no matter what you're doing. And if you're about to spend you know, $2,000 on a flower bed or $2,000 on a, a, a return or something like that, I really honestly feel that less than $100 test 
is something that is vital for you to be able to make whatever project you are doing a success because that way you know what you're doing, you know what you're adding, you know what you need to take away. If you have a problem, it's usually obvious through soil testing. We also do bricks testing, we do sap testing. Um, sap testing is very valuable because sometimes nutrients that are available in the soil might not appear in the plant itself. Um, some things can only be retained foliarly and some things can only be retained through the roots depending on what nutrient or mineral you're talking about. And so sap testing helps and brick testing helps so that you can squeeze the sap out of the leaf of the plant, learn what the plant itself is missing and not necessarily the soil so that you can go further into your testing and remediation. So there are multiple techniques whenever it comes to finding out the, the health and the virility of your plants and your soil. And I highly recommend using all of them, especially if you're getting into more expensive jobs, it will save you money in the long run. Next slide, please. Um, data collection kind of goes along with that. So I use these Toro um, rain sensors throughout my site. And this allows me to just go to my laptop tap up whichever sensor I'm looking at and it will tell me the temperature of the soil, it will tell me the moisture level of the soil and whether I need to water or not. And with the salinity that generally points out what nutrients I might be lacking. There's not very many that are based on salts but a lot of but some of them are and so the salinity level allows me to kind of monitor whenever some of my larger nutrients are running out. Basically the NPKs. Um, so data collection is important because Anytime I am reporting anything about my area, the more numbers, like when I'm talking about how much water we saved, when I'm talking about how much gasoline we saved, or how much fertilizer we didn't use this year, or how much uh, we haven't watered the, rain, the rooftop garden since 2017, being able to use those kind of numbers really makes it to where data collection is important. You want to be able to show that you're saving money. You want to be able to show that you're saving fertilizer. And nine times out of 10, the people that are above me don't know a whole, about, a whole lot about landscape, but they can see the difference of this is how much it's costing us. And so data collection allows us to be able to just really point forward like, we took this much uh, trash out of the creek. We saved this much water compared to this other landscape which spent this much water. And so data collection is very important in anything we do just so that you can be able to quantify everything that you're doing. Next slide, please. So this is our rooftop garden. We have a 22,000 square foot roof, uh, rooftop garden on top of the health center garage, which is also, also the transformation building. So on the seventh floor, um, this is our main rooftop garden here. Um, it was mildly a project in the beginning um, because we had to work with the contractor and then we weren't allowed up there for a little while. So we had a lot of invasive material in the beginning. Um, but we ended up using cardboard boxes. Uh, Jester Dormitory had just put in a bunch of new refrigerators and microwaves. And so I went and raided their roll-off dumpster and stole multiple truckloads of cardboard. And we ended up cardboarding most of the rooftop garden to keep all of the invasives from reseeding, as well as used corn gluten and a couple other techniques to fire the vinegar to try and vacate the rooftop garden from all of the invasive species. In my opinion, I feel like came from the plant material itself. Um, but now, again, we are on, uh, it's, we haven't watered it since October of 2017. There has never been any uh, amendments or fertilizers or um, sprays other than vinegar. Um, but everything else has been all natural or organic. We are not allowed to use any pre-emergence or any uh, chemical sprays because the rooftop garden directly feeds into our cistern and we don't want to be affecting the rest of our site um, because we are affecting one thing. So even things from like ants. We had an ant invasion into the hand clinic um, and so we ended up having to use repellents to just push them away from the clinic because we weren't allowed to use chemicals because it would drain down into the cistern and there are laws against that. So um, again, one of the best places in Austin to pull weeds other than it's in a cactus garden. Uh, the next slide should show I think the beginning of the rooftop garden. Uh, right, so as you can see, so the Wildflower Center uh, worked clo closely with us, and the two square um, templates that you see there each had tape wherever the lines would cross. So now you see that, then you see that there are flags that are colored, and so each flag represented a plant. Uh, 
No, so we haven't had to compost the rooftop garden. And this was actually a question that I brought up with my ecology group when we were walking the site. When we first started the site, we had engineered soils, we had nutrition added, we had literally the perfect growing environment for any type of plant, which also invited in all of our invasives. And so there has been an ongoing debate over the past couple of years of if we had not nutriented our soil, if we hadn't, bring, if we hadn't brought in engineered soil, would we possibly have less invasives because the native plants would have been able to handle the environment better? And so we're really trying to figure out if maybe that's the difference. So the rooftop has not had any amendments added to it unless you count corn gluten because corn gluten is technically like a nine zero zero. So the plants that already exist will get a nitrogen boost, but the seeds will not germinate. So that's technically the only thing that we've ever added to the rooftop garden. And the plant material is still doing fine. And really that's the experiment is we wanna to continue to see if less is more. If we're up there less, if we're adding less, if we're um, invading it less, being humans, which are the biggest invasive, that will the rooftop garden do better on its own? And we have areas throughout our site that we don't visit very often. So less maintenance is actually very important. So the rooftop garden does not receive anything. If it does receive something, it would be more of a compost tea. So an inoculant rather than adding more weight to the roof by adding more materials. In this case, we would just add nutrition or life to be able to help the plants that are currently there. Um, and earlier, I'm sorry, there was a question while using twice as much of 9% pickling vinegar have the same effect as 20% vinegar. It will not. Um, so when you're thinking about vinegar, they freeze distill it. Anything less than 50 degrees, vinegar will start to separate from water. So if you take that 9% and you put it in your freezer and it freezes out into a two-part solution, then that vinegar on the bottom part and the top part will become ice because it's water, will be an 18% vinegar. Same thing if you take a 20% 20 20 vinegar and you put it in the freezer and it freezes out, um, the separation will turn it into a 40% vinegar. And I need to make sure that everyone knows that once you start getting into 30% and higher range, that vinegar will start like literally burning you and other things. When you get into 40 and 50%, you're talking about hydrochloric acid strength, where it will burn through steel, it will burn through plastic, and it will most definitely burn through you. So if you start distilling your own vinegar, which is totally possible for anyone, you can go buy 5%, turn it into 10%, then the 10% to 20% and keep going from there. But I would like to point out that anything above 30% is starting to get into danger range. And at that point, you won't just be killing plants, you will possibly be burning a lot of other things. Um, sorry, that was from an earlier question. So back to the current slides. Um, so anywhere you see a colored flag, that was a particular plant, whether it be the uh, prickly pear or it be brake light or a twisted leaf cactus. Um, there was, I think, six different plants that were used. And so each place that there was a flag, they would place a plant and then they eventually um, planted the entire root. Uh, it was originally overhead spray and then um, drip irrigation. And then again, we shut it off in October of 2017 and it hasn't been watered since then. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's pretty well the finished product of what you would look at right now if you were to look outside of a clinic and see our rooftop garden looking out over Austin. Next slide. Um, so these are some before and after pictures. On the left side, you can see construction is still going on. Waller Creek is still a road. Um, a lot of the plant material had already died off. And these are actually older pictures. It does not do justice. Um, the site now is very well grown. Um, when we went home for several weeks because of COVID, uh, the site took care of itself. We came back and it, it had exploded and there was a lot of invasives, but all of the native materials had fought back just as well. Um, and so it's interesting to see how the theory of, of do less harm. So if I'm gonna go into an area and start pulling invasives and fighting off all the bad guys, Am I going to do more damage by going in there than by just staying away and letting the native plants do their job? 
And so that three weeks that we had several months ago of not being able to come to the site because of COVID and everything that was going on really allowed us to experiment with that and understand that, um, you know, native plants, if they're given the right environment, if they aren't necessarily um, over treated by humans, um, that they can fight off a lot of the invasive plants that we have in our in um, in our cultures, and so it was an interesting learning experience for us to be able to find out, you know, what's better: stay away or go in there and actually tear everything out. Uh, next slide. So on the left side, you can see uh, during all of the planting and things like that, they used erosion matting. They planted four inch plants and then they seeded a lot of that over. Again, we had 50 original species. Uh, and then slowly but surely, we started adding more plant material and more seeds uh, and removing invasives and things like that. And so you can see just with the, that's just within one year. Um, and the site is dramatically overgrown compared to that now. Um, next slide. So this is basically the same spot on the left. Um, that's kind of more of a finished product where they put up all the erosion matting and then they would plant plants every couple of inches um, to try and fill in the area. And then on the right side is the final product of whenever the plant material had grown in and the erosion material had finally kind of started to move along. Um, you know, they say it only takes a year or two for that erosion matting to break down. It really depends. It really depends how much UV it gets, um, how much ability it has for the soil around it to break it down we're still peeling out areas of erosion matting. And in my opinion, um, and as you'll see later in the slides, I don't really feel like it works as well as they think it does. Next slide, please. So on the left picture, this is a beach area. And if you can kind of see where the sand has risen up halfway through the beach. So this was during one of our floods. Um, I'm not sure if this was the Memorial Day flood or the Halloween flood that came in 2015, I believe. But if you look closely, you can see that there's a lot of plant material in there that didn't wash away, but the erosion matting itself did. And so that goes to show that our native plants are excellent for erosion control and for flood mitigation. Um, straighted, uh, planted straight out of the box. Um, it's funny how much of the erosion matting washed away and how many of the plants stayed and actually created what we were originally planning on doing with the erosion matting. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another area, uh, erosion matting planted every couple of inches. Um, and then on the right side, this is kind of the final product. Um, along a lot of our borders, we planted like the buffalo grass um, or turf areas or, or shapeable bushes because part of our education for most people is, is that we want them to think that we are maintaining the area, that we're not just letting it go and that it's not just a big weedy field, but that we intended for it to look certain ways. <coughs> Excuse me. And so... We have a lot of turf areas that are buffalo grass and things like that, that we manicure like it is a turf grass. But that is to say like, oh look, this area is really well maintained. It must mean that the rest of this area is meant to look like that. So for example, the city of Austin on that corner of 15th and Trinity sent us a notice several years ago that they were gonna come mow it down because they got a complaint from blah, blah, blah. And it, it was weedy and out of control. So we had to send them back a response that first said, bye. Sorry, my mom's leaving. She just put my son down. Um, so our first response was, well, we're private property, so you can't come here and mow this. And second, it's supposed to look like that. That's what native Texas looks like. Um, and so they, of course, apologized, and we've never had any problems then. But often that's something that pops up is people – will say, oh man, that just looks so weedy. And my response to them is usually like, well, that's what Texas looks like, so you must not like Texas. And they immediately withdraw and say, no, 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 I love Texas, I don't know what you're talking about. So you just have to educate the population on that just because something is manicured does not mean that it is proper. Um, just because something is wild does not mean that it's not native and beneficial to the environment. So what we really try and do is find that balance between wild and manicured, but still keep things native and still keep things the ability to be able to retain water well and survive through drought and really show off Texas. 
yes, so the question is, do you use signage to educate? We recently, um, we have what's called the green tour on campus, and so it travels throughout campus, uh, and it is on our University of Texas website. Um, and I don't have the link to it, but I can send it out um, to everyone after this to make sure that I have the right website. But there's well over 100 different stops. Um, they have QR codes and informational on the signs so that each sign that you go to gives you a little bit of quip of what's going on in the area. We have pollinator gardens throughout campus. We have orchards, um, food orchards. Um, we have areas that are extremely sustainable and we like to show them off, flood mitigation techniques, uh, the way that we build our buildings and designs, and then the same thing in our area for the medical district is that it's explaining everything that we've done and the importance of what we're doing. Um, and so those signs are hopefully going up by the end of the year. We'll find out. Funding is really weird now. Everything has changed. Um, so hopefully these signs will go up within the next year. Uh, next slide, please. Challenges along the way, um, and so on the left side you can see all that area is now fully grown in and you can't see any of the erosion. Um, but this is another sign of when we had the Halloween flood in 2015. That bridge that is right there, that's 15th Street Bridge and that's the Brecken Ridge parking garage behind it. The water from the Halloween flood got over that bridge and got up to the parking garage. So if you can imagine that that entire picture would have been covered in water during that flood. And if you can see, that's erosion matting that's leaking down into the creek. And so all the erosion matting that they put down and on the right side, that's all plant material that was planted and it was originally covered with erosion matting and there's no erosion matting anymore. So we have changed our thoughts on using erosion matting throughout our projects. Um, especially when planting native plants because the plants themselves do a better job than the uh, matting. Now if you're using a seed product or something to where you want the seed to stay, um, then that might be recommended, but I would suggest that you dramatically staple uh, your product down so that it doesn't get washed away during a quote-unquote 100-year flood, which by the way, we had two 100-year floods during the building of this project. So that uh, changed a lot of the ways that we thought about how we were designing it. Uh, no, go ahead. Go to the next slide. You're good. Uh, on the left side here, this is uh, a case of right, right plant, uh, right, wrong plant, uh, wrong place. And so we have no idea why these wax myrtles failed. Directly across from it on the other side of the sidewalk, same exact design. Those wax myrtles, they're dwarf wax myrtles, but they did great. They're still great. They're still doing fantastic. But for some reason, these on the south side of nursing failed. We did a soil test. We did a fungus test. Couldn't find any pathogens or anything like that. The only thing that we could figure out is that the sun and that the water were hitting it just a little bit differently. And so now that entire area has been turned into a blue bonnet slash random other wildflower bed, um, which has been actually more accepted. People seem to love flowers more than they do green plants. So uh, also on the right side, this shows other areas where we had erosion control problems. Um, at the very top of that hill is the Irwin Center and the Watson House. Um, and we just had continual flooding problems until we finally got the plant material involved. Um, and now we don't have that problem anymore just because we have finally built up our flood mitigation in that area, including bioswales, certain types of plant material, and then redirection of the water into areas that it would be used as a rain garden. Next slide. Uh, and our own people, even our own guys, these are our mechanical distribution guys or sign placers or you know, when they go into an area, they don't consider the cost of the plant material. So this was another luck of me um, having the medical district is that we are, we are considered a satellite entity of the university, which means our funding is not provided by the university. So when the University of Texas does damage to our landscape, I get the ability to be able to charge that landscape damage to the departments that do the damage. So as you can see right here, they're very liberal, or liberal at where they're putting all of their signs and things like that. Uh, they're not like that anymore. Nobody messes with me. That picture on the bottom left-hand corner ended up costing me mechanical distribution a little, little over $22,000 worth of damage for a $1,000 repair. 
So needless to say, those departments call me now before they do any kind of work in my area because they don't want to have that nice fat bill that comes along with replacing all of that native plant material and specialized soils that we have, including irrigation and labor and all of that. And so these are my example pictures and we rarely have any problems anymore. <laughs> Next slide, please. Cigarettes. Um, so we are a tobacco free campus. Um, and so this is a quick poke in to where if you also have a, a tobacco free area and you cannot do things like you do on the left side where you have a butt can or some kind of cigarette ashtray. On the right side, one of my crew members came up with this, Gary Jones, and this is not an ashtray. This is part of the landscaping. This is a landscaping sculpture. Uh, we cannot call it an ashtray but we can include it into the landscape if it is considered a rain garden or a landscaping, whatever you wanna call it, we just can't call it an ashtray. But this is how we solved our problem of no smoking because on the left, as you can clearly see, it's mulch by Marlboro and uh, not one of my favorite companies to buy mulch for. So anyways, that was my quip on cigarettes. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, the homeless population, uh, I am not, I am 100% on trying to help out everyone who's in hard times. Um, and I understand that our landscape is very inviting and that we have an emergency room that treats most of the homeless population. And usually whenever they treat them, they just kick them out the door and they're like, good luck. And there's our very inviting landscape for them to go and set up camps in. And as you can see, sleep in the middle of Waller Creek. I use the picture to cup up, cover up that gentleman's tushy, uh, but we have had nude people bathing in the creek during graduation day, UTPD was called, it's been an entire thing. So um, within the last year, what we've done is we started to work with local groups, um, with uh, ARC, um, which is uh, controlled by a group called Helping Hands. Um, and then there's another, it's controlled by the city of Austin and it is like a detox clinic right south of 14th Street off of I-35. Um, they also have the ability to take people in for a 24 hour period, give them new clothes, a food, uh, meal, uh, healthcare if they need it, um, possible placement into quarter houses or halfway houses. Um, so basically with our homeless population that I'm trying to say is that we, we have moved to the position of we don't just call UTPD and have them removed. We really do try and have a place for them to go um, and that we want them to understand that that not just our landscape is, inv is inviting, but so are we, and that we would really like to help them to be able to get someplace where they're safe and clean and healthy um, and not necessarily destroying our landscape. So it's a quid quo, quid quo pro. Um, we really do try and help them out so that they can move on um, and not necessarily do damage to our landscape, even though I get it. It's, it's a very nice place to set up camp. I would do it myself if I had the ability. Next slide, please. Uh, and so this goes to show with construction on the left, um, the new arena is being built, the uh, capital project is being built downtown where they're turning all of the old state buildings into a large green space. And so silt and construction materials are constantly going to Waller Creek. So I work closely with TCEQ and the uh, uh, environmental health and safety groups and things like that to try and keep as much of our creek as clean as possible because I'm gonna be honest, construction is the biggest contributor to pollution in our creek. And on the right side is tailgating, which I know that that might not happen this year, but every year for six games, tailgating throughout the landscape, including in the medical district, is trampled upon and destroyed on. And I mean, as you can see, it's just, it's a big party and I get it, it's football. I don't get it because I hate football, but anyways, that's one of our biggest, uh, destruction slash detriments. Um, and so fortunately this year, I have now been approved that the medical district is off limits. They are no longer allowed to tailgate in our area and they are no longer allowed to set up camps. Um, and so we'll see how well that transfers to the rest of campus. I know that tailgating is a big deal for everyone who loves football, um, but it's very painful for all of us in landscaping. Um, so next picture, please. And I just had a a uh, couple of questions. So is sign tour only geo-based or can people take a virtual tour? There is not a virtual tour yet. So it is geo-based right now and it's, it's done by um, 
uh, QR codes. So each sign that you get to has a QR code that you can scan. And then there is a, uh, a vocal description of the area as well as some additional information that might go on. Um, and so I, who knows, within the next year, depending on how things go, we might very well be able to put that green tour up on a virtual tour so that you can take it online. Uh, and then another question is, I didn't catch the cigarette butt solution. Are you able to prevent wildlife ingesting or just controlling the spread? It's really just controlling the spread. Um, we don't really have a lot of wildlife coming around the areas that people generally smoke. Um, but I, I can't say that that's not something that happens. Uh, you know, we have large families of raccoons and things like that. They may be addicts. They might like to smoke. So I really can't speak to that. I don't know if it's um, for that, but basically for us, it, it's, it's trying to, you know, we're right outside of an emergency room and right outside of a hospital. And I understand a lot of people are stressed, their families are in there. And if they already smoke, then it's, it's something that you don't want to have to walk a half a block to smoke a cigarette. You just want to be able to go outside, do it real quick, and then get back to your family. And so that's, that's really our, our problem is, is that, you know, it's, it's an addictive substance and it's really hard to help educate people, especially when you're not allowed to have things like uh, ashtrays or places for them to designated smoke. Um, that's, it's just part of our ongoing struggle. Does administration support your decreasing damage as, uh, as from tailgating? Yes and no. So football makes a pretty decent amount of money uh, every year and they basically hand the university $20 million. Doesn't matter how much they make, they're basically just like, here you go, here's $20 million, let us be able to do whatever we want. So I've had several suggestions and some of them are up on the board right now. One of the suggestions for our tailgating is that on every football ticket slash basketball ticket or whatever sporting event, that there be a 25 cent landscape beautification fee. And this would be for us to use in whatever way that we felt. Uh, and this is hopefully gonna go through by this next season. Um, because let's be honest, like, you know, there's some tickets out there that minimum $80 up to, you can get a box at a UT game for $2 million. And so 25 cents on a ticket, you sold out 100,000 100, tickets, then we get $25,000 a game. Six games, that's an extra $150,000 for landscaping to be able to spend on whatever they want. So that's a whole nother story. And I'm really trying to make that happen. But uh, keep your fingers crossed that maybe that, <laughs> that will be able to happen. Um, actually, UT Athletics is very good about only using compostable products inside of the stadium. It's either compostable or recyclable, and they have a team of 300 people, uh, volunteers, after every game that sort through all of the trash that comes out of the stadium. And they put all the compostables in a certain pile, they put all of the recyclables in another pile, and then finally the trash in the last pile. And they've had great success in the past couple of years. Um, and so UT Sustainability has done a great job at being able to work with football, athletics, and the stadium on uh, reducing the amount of waste that goes in and comes out of those games, um, as well as tailgating. We've done a really good job of being able to, to divert a lot of our compostables and recyclables um, to their designated places that they should be going. Uh, and so this is basically my last picture. These guys are the real heroes. Like I'm out there pulling weeds, but nowhere near as much as these guys. They are out there all day, every day. And <clears throat> I'll be honest, without the Native Plant Society and without these guys and a lot of my mentors in my life, I would not be giving you this right now. Um, and so I am very grateful for these guys. They are passionate, they are dedicated. They are all knowledgeable. They're all level three native plant certified, um, as well as, as they've taken a lot of edu uh, other educational courses. So if you ever have the chance to make it out to our site, um, we are in between 15th and MLK and Trinity and I-35. Um, you know, it's, it's really amazing to see what we have done over the past couple of years um, and how much work and, and um, um, dedication that these ladies and gentlemen have put into their job that I am very lucky to have them. And so I always like to point them out because again, without it, I would not be talking to you right now. And I think that's it. Any additional questions or, um, let's see, I'll go back to chat real quick. Um, yes, UT Austin does have a really good sustainability plan online. We've really tried to advertise it. Um, 
And so hopefully everyone will start to realize that we've done a really good job in the past couple of years of reducing our inputs, of reducing the amount of fertilizers we use. We try and be as organic as possible, um, as little pesticide and herbicide use as possible. Uh, really, since I started here 12 years ago, it was 100% chemical. And over the past decade, I have really seen a lot of people step forward, a lot of uh, champions come forward to be able to make uh, what we do possible. And so I am very lucky to work at the university. All right. Um, thank you, Justin. Uh, there was one question, though, that that came in. Can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay, because I can't hear myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> that about um, erosion control, do you know anything about using frost weed and goldenrod for that? Um, no, but both of those would be great for erosion control. You know, another thing that we've had a lot of uh, um, success with is sea oats. Um, you know, it's, it's a heavily seeding plant and once it takes, it really does keep its place. So, um, you know, sea oats is great in the sun and it's great in a riparian environment. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that we have probably used the most when it comes to erosion control. Um, but we have used some other things. So river sedge, it really kind of depends on exactly where your environment is. Um, but deep rooting plants, so like um, sunflowers and um, some of the blue stems that are out there, uh, some of the muleys that are out there and things like that, those that can um, operate in multiple different environments. Um, but no, we haven't used frost weed or goldenrod directly for erosion control, but they are in our landscape. So it, it wouldn't be out of the question for us to start including those in our erosion control setup. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. Well, I think, I think we're probably just going to have to go ahead and, and turn the meeting off for the, uh, for the, for the month. Um, I thank you so much for, for doing this and, um, and gosh, I'd love to see it again when you get uh, your newer pictures. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and invite yeah. everyone down is yeah. that I am, I am happy to give tours down to two people or one person, if it's just one person, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always excited to be able to show off what we're doing and um, be able to teach and educate people that, will be able to take it into other facets of their life. And so um, I will type in my email address here so that oh, if anyone has any further questions or anything like that, they are more than welcome. Excellent, yeah. And once everyone, uh, we'll leave that up for a couple minutes and then I'll go ahead and stop the meeting for everyone. All right. And Austin. edu send there it is okay did that show up on the everyone mm -hmm. excellent okay yeah. and 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 i mean literally i've been doing landscaping for 23 years so if if i don't know the answer to whatever question you might have i promise i know who has that answer all right um, and my final statement would be to say that um you know when i started this job 12 years ago i started taking the native plant society text uh classes uh, and I told myself one day I wanted to be one of the presenters that got up there and was able to share with everybody everything that I had learned from, from native plants and from Texas and all of that. And so to be honest, without the Native Plant Society of Texas, I would not be here today and I would not be doing the job that I do today without you. So I would just like to go ahead and point that out that, you know, y'all, y'all are one of my mentors to where I learned how to be passionate about plants as much as I am. Yeah, well, and you've, you've taught us a lot about landscaping too. This has been really great. Great. Yeah. All right, well, everyone, um, I hope you got his, you can always uh, highlight his email address and copy it down. And, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop, the, uh, stop the sharing and, and end the meeting. So uh, we'll see you all next month, I hope. Bye-bye. Thank you again very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs> Bye-bye.